invitation to speak here. So, uh, probably you have heard about this conjecture somewhere <laughs> during the last years. So I'll start with the basics, and then uh, and then I will discuss some uh, some current topics in, in this subject. Uh, so let me first state the conjecture. So ABC ABC conjecture, and this was posed by Master and Osterle. 1985, around around this year. So the conjecture can be stated as follows: Given epsilon positive, there is some number k epsilon depending only on this choice of epsilon, such that uh, for all co prime. Integers a, b, and c different from zero with a plus b equal to c, and this should um, clarify the ambiguity when I say co-prime integers and I mention three of them. So with a plus b equal to c, uh, we have that the height of this triple, a, b, and c, is less than k epsilon times the radical of a times b times c to the power 1 plus epsilon. So the height here is just the, the naive thing. You take the absolute value of these three integers, and you keep the maximum. Okay? And the radical, I should tell you what the radical is. The radical, I put this up. The radical of an integer m is the product of the primes dividing m with exponent 1. So you write the factorization, and you raise exponents, and you just keep 1. Okay, That's the radical. And now some remarks. The reason there is an epsilon here is that, of course, you would like to have the lowest exponent here if you want to have such a bound. However, if you don't put the epsilon, it doesn't matter how large this constant is, this is going to be false. There are going to be infinitely many counterexamples, a sequence of counterexamples. So you definitely need an epsilon there. Now, one way to think about this conjecture is that whenever you have an additive condition on the integers, this will tell you something about the multiplicative structure of m in the following sense. a, b, and c cannot have too many repetitions in the prime factorization. That's the, that's the moral of this, of this statement. Okay? Uh, the, the heuristic here, well, not heuristic, but the, naively, what it's saying that is that every time you impose an additive condition of this type, since you have a lower bound for the radical, the radical cannot be so small. So if you raise the exponents in the factorization, you cannot lose too much. That's what it's saying. So, uh, right. So I don't want to mention right now some motivation for this, because later I will talk about the elliptic curves. And then it's going to make some more sense. But uh, let me make some remarks about how to formulate this in a way that perhaps is easier to generalize or to understand what's going on. So the remark here is that if I write the rational number q equal to a over c in the notation of the conjecture, then well, every time I have a prime number, p dividing a, that condition is going to be equivalent to saying that q is congruent to 0 mod p. There's a point in p1 if you want to think about this in that way. Uh, that's the, the meaning of having a congruence with a rational number. Now, if p divides b, that's going to be equivalent to what? Well, you look at the equation, and if this is going to disappear, you end, you end up with a over c equal to 1, right? So. If p divides b, then q is congruent to 1 mod p. And that's equivalent, actually, and because they are co-prime. And then the other case, when p divides c, this is the same as saying that this point in the projective line is equivalent to the point at infinity mod p. So you can think about this statement as telling you something about how a rational number approximates, in a non-Archimedean sense, the three targets 0, 1, and infinity. That can be used to give a formulation of the conjecture, a formulation which is easier to generalize. So here's an alternative formulation, ABC again. Uh, 
And this is going to be equivalent, actually. So fix any epsilon positive and three this next thing this tinct. And let me use the word target, although it doesn't have a mathematical meaning. Targets. B1, B2, B3, rational points in P1. So rational numbers, or you can take infinity if you want. Oh, so the conjecture will say that all, but finally many, uh, Q rational points in P1, Satisfy, satisfy the bound um, one minus epsilon little h of q less than sum j from one to three, and one. I will explain what this notation means. So here, little h is the logarithmic height, which is log. So that's the conjecture. So little h is log of the maximum of the absolute value of numerator and denominator of the rational number you put there. So right. And, uh, and what is this n1? n1 is what people call the truncated counting function. So this is going to measure the coincidences of these two numbers or points, right, mod p for different primes, but for getting the multiplicities and putting a logarithmic weight. So completely, and one bq is by definition the sum over all p's, uh, all primes p with uh, b congruent to q mod p, and the weight you put for this prime is log p, okay? So it's basically take the logarithm of the radical and take this into account when you want to rewrite the, the, the inequality. You may be wondering what happened with this k epsilon. Well, k epsilon somehow, appear, but in the form that allowing finitely many exceptions. You allow finitely many exceptions, that takes the role of this k epsilon. So now you may be worried about the fact that I'm using here 0, 1, and infinity, but here I have any three points. That's not something to be worried about because you can use Mobius transformations to go back and forth, and you just need to keep track of what is the distortion when you do this. Okay. So actually, this is equivalent to ABC. And you may be wondering, what if I want to put more targets? Okay. Well, instead of three points, I want to put more points. Is that stronger or harder, easier? Well, actually, it is equivalent. So ABC, uh, several targets. And as you name, uh, as you mentioned some names here, Voita, Elkis. So Elkis, notice that using BLG maps, you can reduce the general case of many targets to the case of three targets. The BLG map is some particular kind of rational function that is going to have branch locus only at zero, one infinity, and can map certain uh, whatever finite number of points that you want. You can map it to zero, one infinity, keeping the ramification being mapped to the same set. So it's a very particular type of rational function. It's quite convenient for this. So Elk is notice that using those rational functions, you can get a statement with many targets. And it also fits in general theoretical framework by Voita, by analogies with Nevalina theory. And the statement will be, uh, you take the, well, the setup is more or less the same, but the targets will be B1 up to Bm. And then the inequality will read m minus 2 minus epsilon h of q less than some um, j going from 1 to m and 1 <coughs> bj q. It's going to read uh, like this. Uh, now, there is a minus 2 here. So what is this minus 2? So the analogies of Voita predict that the reason for this minus 2 is that the canonical sheath of P1 is O of minus 2. 
And I don't want to explain right now why, but uh, the, the, the only important thing about the, what I'm mentioning here is that there is a general framework for formulating conjectures of this type. And in this framework, there is a, theory, uh, there is a conjectural explanation for this minus 2. Instead of using the number of targets, you, you need to shift this. And the reason comes from the fact that the canonical shift will appear in these sort of inequalities, according to Voiton. Now, these points need not be rational, but the, the, the actual condition can be relaxed a little bit. And this is important for applications. You don't need every single BEI to be rational. What you want is that the divisor um, This is uh, defined over Q. That's enough for the application of Belly maps. Okay? So it's not that every single point is a rational point, but it, just this whole set is stable under Galois action. And the important thing is that you can, for instance, apply this to the case where your divisor is the following. V is equal to the zero locus of some polynomial F plus the point at infinity, so F is a polynomial with integral coefficients. And you restrict yourself to the case where when, when q is an integer. OK? So when q is an integer, this sort of condition will not show up. So you will not get a contribution for the point at infinity. So the point at infinity will show up on this side of the inequality, but not here, just because you're focusing on integers. And, uh, and why this special case is of particular interest is because it's like a user-friendly version of uh, this general conjecture. It's ready to use, to some say. Oops, I should move this up. I'm sorry about that. Uh, OK, sorry. <laughs> right, so the, the bound you will get is the following result by Elkis and Langevin. is that uh, if, uh, if you let f be a polynomial with integral coefficients, and here comes the fact that I want the points to be distinct, so I need to require that f is a square free. In the sense that it has no repeated factor, then um, under ABC, you have the bound, uh, the radical of the value of f at an integer can be estimated from below using some implicit constant, which may depend on f and epsilon, which is going to show up here, by uh, n to what power? Well, if I didn't have the radical here, it's not hard to see that you can put here the degree of f. And the noise will only come from the coefficients of f. However, I have the radical. So I need to allow some loss here. So what is it? According to the ABC conjecture, well, if you read it here, you have a minus 2 minus epsilon. But since I'm only focusing on integers, I already explained that you can save using the point at infinity. You get minus 1 minus epsilon. Okay. And now you see that this is much more elementary. And for some applications, this is enough. But it's just another manifestation of this ABC conjecture formulated in that form. Right? Now, uh, right. now you can ask, what is the dependence on f, actually, in this constant? For some applications, that's useful. So one can work it out. Uh, and actually, for some application, we really need this with uh, Ram Murthy. The radical of f n times, and the dependence is, the, the, the dependence is really poor, but it's enough for some applications. Uh, r, let me write r degree of f, OK? Alpha r height of f, beta r bigger, bigger than r epsilon, n to the power r minus 1 minus epsilon, OK? 
So these alpha r and beta r are some huge constants depending on only on the degree but not the coefficients and you can keep track on the dependence on the coefficients and for this you don't need an effective ABC I mean the ineffectivity or effectivity of ABC that the version of ABC that you're using will be encoded here uh, it's just the same ABC conjecture and that is useful sometimes okay so uh, right so the the advantage of taking uh, this kind of formulation yes Yes, that's the reason I didn't write the whole statement again. I, I mean, under the same conditions, same condition, square free defined over with integral well, coefficients, well, right? Well, yeah, and the degree, the degrees well, are. Well, the degrees are. Yeah, okay. the degrees are. Maybe my R looks like sigma or gamma or something. Okay. Good. So, uh, right. So there is another advantage of formulating the conjecture in this way is that now is more or less clear how to generalize this to number fields. Okay. So in number fields, you will not have uh, unique prime factorization in elements of uh, in, in integers. However, you can still formulate a version of this truncated counting function using, using valuations. And instead of log p, you put log of the norm of the prime ideal associated to the valuation. So that can be used to formulate the ABC conjecture over number fields. And there are other advantages of this formulation, but I don't want to go into technicalities. I, mean, I think that's enough to clarify how to think about ABC in this way. Now, let me mention some applications. Um, so that was the first part of the talk, uh, the statement, OK? Now, second part, applications. So of course, first thing that comes to mind, application 0, is ternary equations. And I don't want to say too much about this, because it's classical and elementary how to apply the ABC conjecture to an equation with three terms. But let me just mention some. Uh, x to the n plus y to the n is equal to z to the n, which is, by the way, already proved. But the whole point of applying ABC to this is that shows how powerful the conjecture is. It gives right away a solution to this for sufficiently large n. So this is from Maxwell's theorem. So this is already proved. But nonetheless, ABC seems to imply this directly for a large n, and that's somehow evidence for this conjecture to be difficult. Um, you also have um, Catalan's conjecture, which is also proved, a theorem of Mihalescu, which is x to the p minus y to the q equal to 1, where p and q are at least 2. And so the question is, what are consecutive powers? So there are some trivial solutions involving 0. And uh, there is also the non-trivial solution 9 minus 8. And that's it. So this is Catalan's equation. And of course, you can also apply ABC to this problem and get some non-trivial information right away. Here's a, another question, uh, which is Brockhardt's Ramanujan problem. n factorial plus 1 is equal to uh, k squared. You want to write squares factorial plus 1. And the question is, how many solutions are there for this equation? The conjecture is finally many. This is Brockhardt. And this problem is open. Of the three, this is the only open one. And yet, you can continue. I mean, as long as you have three terms in the equation, and as long as you can somehow get many repeat repeated factors, ABC will tell you something non-trivial about the equation. Now, I want to discuss some other applications where it's not immediately obvious that ABC has anything to say about. So rational points. So. In this case, there is a, classi a classical application by Elkis, classical today, which is uh, related to the following theorem of Faltings. Is that if you have a nice curve over Q, so nice meaning uh, projective, smooth, irreducible, of genus 
these two. Of course, these assumptions are only just to, I don't need to explain what the genus is because uh, any of the choices will be the same, of genus at least two. Uh, then uh, the number of rational points of this curve is finite. So this was a conjecture by Mordell, proved by Fartings, and then proved again by Voita, and then by Bombieri. And this led to many developments in number theory. And the proofs are not easy. But Elkis realized that ABC implies an easy proof, quotation marks, because it's a conjecture, so easy. Easy proof. So how is that? I don't want to give the proof, but I just want to give you an idea of what's going on with this proof. So you start with the curve, and remember I already mentioned these value maps from P1 to P1, but actually they exist from any curve defined over a number field to P1. And such a map going from C to P1 will have the property that all the ramification points of this map will be mapped to the set 0, 1, infinity. So the branch locus is just contained here. So what Elkis did is that starting from a value map like this, He used Riemann Hurwitz to have some information on how is the ramification of this map distributed. And as long as the genus is at least two, Elkis observes that for every point uh, which is rational, the rational number or the point of P1 phi of x, if you take this q, will not satisfy the three targets ABC bound. The one written over here. So if you believe in the conjecture, that can only give finally many cases. And therefore, you get finiteness for this set. So that's more or less the, the idea behind the proof. Of course, there is some non-trivial argument to show that uh, this geometric condition will imply the arithmetic condition of not satisfying the inequality, but that's the whole point of the paper. So this is Elkis. And this is already surprising because a single equation that comes from the fact that you can add two integers to get a third integer, and this addition will give you some non-trivial condition on the factors of these integers, which looks pretty an elementary statement, actually encapsulates the information of arithmetic for all curves over Q, okay, of genus at least two, in the sense that it implies finiteness easily, at least easier than uh, than in yeah, at least easier than the uh, original proof. Should I move this up, right? Okay. Now uh, that's with. Uh, a statement about rational points, but this is in dimension one. What about higher dimension? Maybe ABC can tell you something, and it does. Not universally, but uh, in many cases, ABC can be used to get information on rational points and higher dimensional varieties. And here's an example. So there is the following problem by Erdős. I already mentioned this in a previous lecture. The question is, uh, uh, let U inside of the real plane be a rational distance set. What is a rational distance set? It's just a set of points in R, in, in the real plane, so that for every pair of points in the set, the distance, the Euclidean distance, is rational. I'm not requiring that the coordinates be rational. So these points may have transcendental coordinates, but somehow they are arranged in such a way that the distances are rational. Okay. Uh, the question is, uh, can u be dense? Dense in what sense? Well, 
even for the Euclidean topology, this is open. But if you can prove it's not very risky, then that would be even stronger, right? But even for the Euclidean topology, this is not known. This, is, this question is open. Okay. So is there any example of an infinite set like this? Yes, of course. For instance, you can take a line, the x-axis, and just put a dot in every rational point. And the distance, automatically, all of them are rational, right? Uh, that's kind of boring. There is a less boring example using elliptic curves. You can do an infinite set of rational points in the x-axis with four points away. Actually, it's honestly two points, and then you reflect. Okay, you see some tricks uh, from arithmetic geometry. Uh, but then what? You can take one of these four points away from the line and invert the plane centered on this point rational radius. Now the point is going to be mapped to infinity. The line becomes a circle, and the other three points remain three points. If the radius of the inversion is rational, the distances will remain rational. So this other configuration is going to be a circle with three points away. This is also an infinite rational distance set. Now the theorem here is that ABC over number fields okay, implies uh, the only infinite rational distance sets are contained in uh, these two cases. Line plus four points and circle plus three points. And the reason I mentioned this related to rational points of varieties is because it is related. Uh, Tao and independently Shafaf realized that this problem can be formulated in terms of arithmetic geometry. And in that case, you end up with a surface of general type, which unfortunately has regularity zero. Therefore, it's not covered by the general theorems of Hartings. You cannot embed it in some, you cannot even map it to, non-trivially to an abelian variety. So for that case, we don't know the Lang's conjecture. So ABC implies a case of Lang's conjecture, which is open. In, so the, I don't know, the, maybe if you don't care about this elementary statement, uh, I, I guess the important thing is that uh, ABC is not just confined to dimension one. That's, that's the point. OK. But there are other applications of this conjecture of a totally different flavor. So, right. So, for instance, you can count square free. So, application two, I guess. Two count square free values of polynomials. And the first result in this direction by Granville. So, you start with F polynomial with integral coefficients, square free, no repeated factor. And you want to count uh, how many square free values you get up to certain bounds. So the natural quantity to define is this one Okay, So you count the square free values. And the expectation, so the conjecture, is that this can be given up to an error term by expected density times x times an error term. Okay. So this constant is, can be written explicitly and is an infinite product of local densities. So when the constant is 0, it show, uh, you can show incondi unconditionally that if the co this constant is 0, there is a local obstruction. And therefore, you know for sure there is no square free value. In which case, this conjecture tells you nothing. The interesting case is when this constant, pr appropriately defined, is not zero. Does it imply you have infinitely many square free values? That's open. In the case, uh, so uh, open for the general case when f, uh, the degree of f is bigger than 3. Well, if f factors as a product of irreducible factors of degree at most 3, then you can deal with this. Uh, the other cases are done by, so when the degree 
is at most three. This is fully. Yep. So Granville, the, the reason I put the name of Granville here is because Granville showed that this problem of analytic number theory can be attacked by under the ABC conjecture. And the uh, and the result is that ABC implies this formula. Right, so uh, as long as you have any particular, I mean, give me any reducible polynomial of degree at least four. We don't even know if it takes infinitely many square free values. So let alone the asymptotic formula. So that's a, that's a state of art. And there's no reducible polynomial, which is not, I'm, I'm strengthening what you're saying. Oh, yeah. that's right. So let me pose a problem which is harder. Uh, well, not me. Uh, this was posed by, by Erdish. So Erdish managed to show that in some cases of degree 3, irreducible of degree 3, there are infinitely many square free values. It was Hulley who got the asymptotic formula. But in that paper, Erdish showed, uh, well, he commented that whatever technique I'm using is specific to the fact that integers have uh, this notion of natural density, and I can deal with that because there are many integers. But what if I look at a, a set which is sparser, like the primes? So Erdős' problem will be count uh, to consider the following quantity: n prime f x, the number of p up to x where p is a prime, so that f of p is square free. So because of time, I cannot outline a proof of Granville's theorem. But the idea is basically this. You do a preliminary easy sieve, and then you end up trying to show that certain set of exceptions is small. So the way he does it is using an argument of density. However, this set of exceptions, although it has density 0 in the integers, that tells you nothing about the primes, because the primes also have density 0 in the integers. right? So how you, how you do that? So let me tell you explicitly what is this set of exceptions that you need to be small. In this case, SF, the bad set, maybe I should put EF because it's exceptions, right? The bad set is all the primes P with the property that there is another prime Q at least of the size of P so that Q squared divides F of P. If you can show that this set has density zero in the primes, then we're in business, and you get the asymptotic formula, the expected asymptotic formula. So let me just write that. Density in the primes of this set EF prime equal to 0 implies that NF prime x is equal to CF prime. This constant is different, but it's also a product of local densities times x over log x plus little o of x over log x. So that's a challenge. And how you show that a set of primes has density 0 in the primes? Well, fortunately, today we have tools for doing that. It's in a case which is convenient for this problem. So the way one can deal with this is showing that this set of primes doesn't have arithmetic progressions of certain length. So if a set of prime doesn't have arithmetic progressions of certain length, it has to have density 0 by this green tau theorem. So that's the way one can deal with that. So the theorem here is that ABC over number fields implies uh, that, uh, well, not the theorem. Let me just write what I just said. This implies that uh, this SF has no and there is a little caveat here, uh, arithmetic progression of length degree of f to the power 3 times 6 plus 1, which is some fixed numbers. 
And this implies by the Green Tau theorem, improved by Siegler also, that the density in the primes of this set S F prime <coughs> is zero. And that finishes the problem. So uh, right, so ABC conjecture can actually be used in this uh, analytic number theoretical problems, giving you non-trivial information. And the last kind of applications I want to mention, I mean, you can talk forever on applications on ABC, but I just want to give you a glimpse on, on this. There is, um, right, and so there are applications in logic. So uh, definability in number theory. There is a following theorem by Woods, Alan Woods, and Langevin. So Woods did the logic part, and after some time, Langevin showed that the arithmetic hypothesis followed from the ABC conjecture. And the final statement is that, uh, right, uh, ABC implies solution to a problem of Julia Robinson. Namely, uh, that Equality, addition, and multiplication are definable in the structure natural numbers with coprimality. This is a binary relation. A orthogonal to B means uh, A and B are coprime. Coprimality and the successor function. Okay, so this is the unary function that takes n to n plus one. So this is a very poor language. You are not even allowed to say equal. OK. So the, the problem of Julia Robinson proposed to her, to her by, well, suggested by Tarski, uh, but she couldn't actually do it in the thesis, so she left this as an open problem. If this poor language is actually strong enough to recover the usual arithmetic of the integers. And uh, the answer is yes under ABC. So that's kind of surprising. Let me mention another application in logic, just to show that this is not an isolated example. So there is. Um, so the problem is still open. The problem is open. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know. Maybe somebody comes up with some clever way to define this, but uh, it's A B C that implies this solution. This, this thing. Maybe I didn't state this properly. Let me read it. Uh, Better? Okay. <laughs> so that's the problem of Euler Robinson. Are these definable in this structure? And the answer is yes. Uh, so ABC implies yes. So Woods did a lot of work on this. So Woods showed that any of this solves the problem. If you can define any of this, you solve the problem. And then there is Buki's problem. And the theorem here, uh, I don't want to state the problem, but the, the, the theorem will tell you what the problem was. So the theorem is that uh, Voigt's conjecture, which is basically the ABC conjecture for algebraic numbers of bounded degree. You give a bound on the degree, and you formulate a version of ABC in that case. And you need to be careful about keeping track of the numbers. Okay. So Voigt's conjecture in dimension Dimension one, which is the relevant case for that's a relevant case for ABC, implies that uh, multiplication is positive existentially definable in uh, the integers, and the signature is going to be zero, one, addition, equality. And now I want to remark that it's impossible for a multiplication to be definable in this signature alone, positive existentially, just because this is decidable, but this is going to be undecidable, just because of that. So you need to put something else. And this something else is going to be a unary predicate, P. And this unary predicate can be taken as 
uh, kth powers for some fixed k bigger than or equal to 2. You can also take uh, powers or powerful numbers. So the undecidability consequence will be you take linear systems of equations, you impose conditions. I want this variable and that variable to be a power. And that's already undecidable. Okay. Okay. So for instance, Catalan's problem can be formulated in this setting, but not in this setting. Okay. So they are actually different problems. And here it's also open, even for squares, that's still open. The case of squares attracted a lot of attention. So for instance, Voita showed in 2000 that uh, if you assume the bombieri lang conjecture in dimension two, then you get the same statement for the case of second powers for squares. So that involves some not so immediate algebraic geometry. OK, so right. So that's enough of applications. Let me say something about what to do with this conjecture, uh, try to uh, approach the problem. So take me to the third part of the talk, elliptic curves. So there is an earlier conjecture of Spiro. So this was formulated before than the ABC conjecture. And for simplicity, let me just do it over Q. So there are two constants, A, B, such that for every elliptic curve defined over the rational numbers, there is a bound like this. That uh, the discriminant, the minimal discriminant in absolute value is bounded by constant times the conductor of the elliptic curve to some power. So the known thing here, known, is that the conductor divides the discriminant. So what Spear is asking is, are these two quantities more or less of the same order of magnitude? So can you give a, an opposite bound, which is of polynomial size? So maybe I should tell you what is the discriminant and the conductor. The discriminant is just, well, the elliptic curve can be written as y squared equals a cubic. And for a well-chosen equation, the discriminant is more or less, more or less, the discriminant of the cubic. Okay. The reason I say more or less is because the minimal discriminant has an issue in that way if you want to do it over, I mean, for, for primes like 2 and 3. But that's a minor problem for this purpose. Okay. Now the conductor is defined in terms of Galois representations that attach to the elliptic curve. So in a sense, both quantities are measuring the degeneration of the elliptic curve modulo primes. But they are measuring in a different way. So the discriminant has a more geometric flavor because it can be interpreted in terms of the special fiber of narrow models, while this has a representation theoretical flavor. So the question is, well, if both are related to arithmetic, maybe they are of the same order of magnitude, although they are defined in different ways. And the connection with the ABC conjecture was pointed out by Fry. So Fry, notice that Suppose you start with an ABC equation, A plus B is equal to C. You can define the following elliptic curve. Y squared is equal to the following cubic, x, x minus A, x plus B. So if you compute what are the minimal discriminant and the conductor of this elliptic curve, that involves some work to be done correctly. But one can do it. And uh, this is approximately, well, what is the naive discriminant here? The roots are 0, A, and minus B. So you compute the differences of roots, take the square of the product, and you get A, because you have 0 and A here, uh, times B, times A minus minus B, which is C. Okay. And the approximate means that there is an issue of 2, so there is some bounded error, some bounded factor error here. Okay. Maybe a better symbol is this. And then NE, one can compute it. And uh, the result is approximately the radical of ABC. So these curves are almost semi-stable. There is an issue at 2. But so, so what? So if you believe in this conjecture on elliptic curves applied to this particular type of elliptic curves, you will get that A, B, and C can be bounded from above by some power of the radical. 
So this is some weak version of the ABC conjecture, but that's already unknown. So if one can show something like that, that already implies a very deep result on related to the ABC conjecture, something that we may call a ABC conjecture. So in this way, you can reduce the problem to some extent to the arithmetic of elliptic curves. But the question remains, how you get a hold of these quantities? Because so far, it's only definitions, right? So, right, so good. So there is a tool available over Q, which is uh, the modular parametrization. But before doing that, let me introduce another invariant attached to the elliptic curve, which is the Falcon site. Uh, conveniently, when the elliptic curve is defined over Q, there is an easy way to write down the Falcon site, for which I need omega uh, global minimal uh, differential. on my elliptic curve over Q, meaning that I take a narrow model and there is a global one just because we're working over Q and the class number here will be one, and it can be taken globally. So when you take this differential form, the factor's height will be minus one over two log of the volume of the curve with respect to the volume form attached to the differential. So E complex points, Okay, there is a normalizing factor that I want to ignore at this point. Now, Silverman expressed explicitly this in terms of uh, more classical invariants, and from that expression, you get a lower bound, one over twelve log of this discriminant. So, if you can give an upper bound for the Falcon's height, we're in business. Okay. Now, the good thing is that this is a an analytic object, and one can hope that techniques of analysis or some analytic tool can give you some idea of what to do here. Now, from arithmetic, one has um, well this deep theorem of modularity, by Wiles, Taylor Wiles, and many others. And here, uh, in this particular version, it's really important the work of Carroll also to identify what is the level of the parametrization. So there is a function going from some specific curve uh, that I want, don't want to tell you what is this, but the only important thing is that it, this is a curve whose only parameter for the construction is this integer n. I tell you n, and there is a very concrete way to construct the curve. Okay, And there's going to be a map to E, which is non-constant, and this n happens to be the same as the conductor of E. So in particular, if I tell you what n is, one can compute, or one can hope to compute, analytic invariance of this curve in a rather direct way. Okay? Well, here, the analytic invariant, this volume, with respect to this arithmetically normalized fo volume form, is not clear. So uh, the magic happens, and when you pull back the differential to try to compute this integral over here, w we know something about the pullback of this differential. So the pullback of the differential is going to be equal to 2 pi i c f of z dz, where f is a normalized Hecke eigenform. Now I'm identifying modular forms with the differentials on the modular curve. It's, it's like a piece of notation. But uh, c is a non-zero integer. So this is the Manning constant. And well, assuming that this parametrization is minimal in some sense, uh, one can show that this is an integer, non-zero. And then you're in business, because now we can pull back this differential, this volume form, here, compute the volume. And the bound that you get is that the height of e is less than, uh, where is it? OK, 1 over 2. Well, you do the math here, and you get log the degree of phi plus some bounded error term coming from lower bounds for the Peterson norm of this modular form. 
Now, the amazing thing, and here I'm almost done, is that this degree has an arithmetic meaning independent of the curve. It can be interpreted intrinsically in the modular side. And that's an, a result of Rivet, that this modular degree measures congruences between modular forms. So this is Rivet. And uh, using this interpretation, one can work on the modular side and get some unconditional result. So here's, for instance, uh, two results one can get. Well, I, right, so Murti and myself, we get that the logarithm of the degree phi is bounded by n log n, which is exponentially bad. I want to clarify that. Okay. And von Kainel, Raphael, who is in, at Princeton, around the same time, but independently, he got uh, log of the degree is bounded by n log n squared, okay? Which is slightly worse, however, both cases are effective. And from this, what you get is an effective partial result for ABC, which is exponentially bad, but has some consequences. For instance, you can get an effective solution of a classical problem called the S-unit equation. And that's non-trivial in the sense that uh, the first effective solution had to wait till Baker developed this theory of linear forms in logarithms. Now, of course, this is only for S-unit equations over the integers, but uh, right. And uh, finally, let me just say what is the best current known bounds. They are not obtained in this, in this way. They are obtained by linear forms in logarithms. So the best bounds are uh, for ABC, not for, not for the modular side, okay? For ABC, the best bounds are log of the height of A, B, and C, less and less than, well, maybe not the best, but this is certainly the first in 86, I think, but this was Stewart and Tickleman. And the best that we have today is n to the 1 over 3 plus epsilon, and this is Stewart and U. And what is n in terms of the original? Oh, uh, yeah, I should, I should say that. Yeah, there is slight abuse of notation here. And I'm thinking about n as the radical of a times b times c. So yeah, I kept this notation, which is not precise, but anyways, it's absorbed here. So let me just be precise, OK? Um, So this is also exponentially bad, but you see the exponent is lowering here on this side. So, and this is what I wanted to say. Thank you. <laughs>